So today uh, is going to be the last day of talking about the front end of the compiler. So we went over finite state machines and regular expressions for lexing and getting the words of our language. We went over parsing, how to get a tree representation of the grammatical structures of our language. And today we're going to go over type checking. Uh, the first thing we can actually use that tree for is to enforce type rules on our program. And We'll go over today why you might want to do that, when you might not want to do that, what the limitations are, and how to actually implement that. Um, so also, just as a reminder, if you, if you got a grade that you're unsure about or unhappy with on your toy compiler, come to office hours, let me know. I'll go over and, uh, and regrade it or try to walk through what happened. Um, today, the first part of the simple C compiler is due, the parsing part. Um, there's lots of good questions on, on ed discussions, lots of questions in office hours. I hope every, that, that this project makes sense to everyone. I hope everyone is, is, is getting it. Um, and that's due tonight. And then today, the next part of the project, project two, um, will be due in two more weeks. And I'll go over today that project and uh, everything you have to do for it. So I guess, first of all, questions on the parsing project. Yeah. 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 Let me get there. What was it? Type list opt. This one? Oh, sorry. I can't see that. This one. Uh, okay, so this is the type constructor for a function type. Uh, and so you look at the, let's go over the uh, API. So here, this is in the type one of the alternatives for type. So if we go here to look at the AST constructors for all of the type alternatives, we have, uh, we have a constructor for function type. And a function type takes the type of the arguments and the type of the return value. And uh, the syntax for that is the keyword function followed by a parenthesized, parenthesized list of type names followed by arrow to refer to the return type, and then the return type, the single type for the return type. So I know I kind of went over the, the semantics of the language a little informally. I just showed you examples. Um, but it's hard to formalize it without just doing this. This is kind of the, the formalization of it. Other questions on the, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a good question, yeah, and I'll go over this. Um, so, it, strictly speaking, it does in a compiler because you need the AST in order to do this type checking part. But I've given you, so in, in previous years, what I did is I made it one big project that everyone downloads and then you kind of build on your prior one and I gave you a pre-compiled version of the previous project so that, you know, you wouldn't be penalized for on the next project. Um, this time, there's just separate Git repositories. So, it's already set up with the pre-compiled binary for the first phase in the Git repository that you're going to use for this project. Um, that does mean that, but it's, it's compiled for the Vagrant virtual machine, so it might work on your system, depending on what system you use, but uh, if you definitely, if you haven't set up the Vagrant Vagrant machine or you have issues with it, uh, let me know because that pre-compiled binary is, I, could, I built it in the virtual machine so that everyone would have the same machine. Um, yeah, if you're on like a different system, if you're on Windows or Mac, it may not, that precompiled binary may not link with your, uh, the rest of your project. But yeah, you won't have to get the first project right in order to successfully do the second project. And also remember, because I think some people um, didn't catch this, or maybe you weren't here at the, be at the beginning of class, uh, my, my hope for you is that you will get a complete working compiler on your own in this class, just have the experience of doing this really large, complicated project. And to help 
make that possible, um, for the Simplicity Project, you can always resubmit as much as you like even if you're past the deadline, all the way up until basically the end of the class, uh, until I put a date on here, I think that's the final, with a very, very minimal loss in points. You know, I, I don't want everyone to just wait, um, but the loss of points is very, is very minimal. Like, you can still, you know, get an A in the course, technically, if you have a couple projects late. But my goal is to have you actually get through all the projects. So, if, you know, struggle on this deadline and try to get everything in, but then remember, you can go and refine after that, when you, if you have some, I know nobody has time, but if you have some time, go in and refine that after maybe a later project, you understand earlier projects better, or it's, there was some sticky bug that you couldn't, couldn't get. Uh, learning failure is kind of part of learning. You know, if you're too afraid to fail, you may not, you may not learn much. So I, I, I want you to actually learn and have the experience of building this compiler, because it, for most people up until now, this is probably the largest project you've, you've built. You know, it's, it's not just a couple hundred line programs, it's a large complex piece of software with multiple phases and very complicated uh, testing that you have to do for it. There's lots of possible inputs. So remember, you can, even if today, you feel like you, even if you got really low points, you got very, you know, you, you almost got nothing right. Tomorrow, you can keep working on it and resubmit it. And just let the graders know, let us know. They're not going to grade immediately. They'll probably grade in batches. So once enough people need regrading, um, then they'll regrade. But you can always just push. You know, you can just push to your repository. It's the same, it's the same repository. Uh, questions? Question, other questions on, on this? Other questions on the project? Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a hard question just in computing in general. I mean, when you have compl a, a complex set of inputs, testing is never really enough, uh, especially in a compiler where we have an inf infinite possible set of inputs. And so technically speaking, there's no way we can actually test all those inputs. Um, yeah, and so I, 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 that's why I tried to give you this, this, this uh, development strategy where you you focus on a part of the code and then write your own tests. I know it's really common up until this point, you know, if you're not like a professional programmer, to just take the test that the teacher gave you and build to that. That's like teaching to the test. You know, you're, you're programming to the test. Uh, the, the, the safe way to do it is to make up your own tests, or at least program to what's the right answer, and then the tests confirm. And so we've, yeah, I've tried to give you like a suite of tests that cover lots of different cases, but they're really a sample. So it might be the case that you tested addition, and an addition operation parses perfectly, but subtraction, there's a little mistake. Uh, and so there's no guarantee that subtraction will work if addition works. So I, I, I very strongly encourage you to just write test cases as you, as you go. But if you've done that, and then all of our tests pass, it's very likely that the hidden tests will also pass. They're not like that much wildly different. Than, than the given tests, as long as you're not just programming to the test. It's really just to make sure that, you know, you could just hard code the answers for all of our tests, technically. You could write a program that just says, oh, is, it this, is this the input? Then spit out the exact output. You could do that, but um, it would be hard, hard no way of knowing unless we had secret tests or looking at the code. Other questions about the uh, project? So remember, this is not like the final deadline. You can, Continue to work on this. And then hopefully by the end, you can put all these pieces together. You can just you know, take one of the repos and copy in, take the last repo, copy in all of your code, and then you can have the whole compiler uh, that you've written yourself. Other questions on the project? All right, how about the homework? Did everyone really enjoy doing that homework? Yeah. <laughs> a few people did. Was it also very tedious and tricky and sticky to do with? So it's, it's, you know, it's hard to get this kind of, these algorithms are, are very specific and they're very kind of nitpicky, um, which is why we have tools to automate generating these, this code instead of running it. Um, all right, so who, should, should I go over the homework? Raise your hand if I should go over the homework. Who doesn't want to go over it? 
All right, so it's, it seems like more are interested in seeing it. So let's yeah, let's go over this. Uh, let's go over this this homework here. Here's the answer here. All right. So this is our grammar. And our input was A, A, C, D, B, B, and this was our grammar. This is our parse table. So the setup here is that you have a look ahead, and um, yeah, one thing, maybe I didn't make it clear enough, but a couple people had, uh, were confused on when the input is consumed. So this arrow means we're just peaking the input. We're not actually reading it from the input. Uh, and the only time the input actually gets read is on a shift action. So reduce actions, go tos, they don't actually consume input. They're just recognizing the uh, complete production. We have our state stack. This is our input. And we always start at the starting state, state zero. And I'll also draw the tree as we go and list out the actions. Okay, so we're in state zero and our look ahead is A. So what parsing action does our table tell us to take? Shift two, good, shift two. So shift operations take the input and push it onto the stack along with the new uh, state which was given to us in the parsing table. Okay. So now we look at the next input, and without consuming it, we look at the current state of our parser, and we look at the next input in our input. So we're in state two, and we see A. What action, parsing action, does our table tell us to take? Shift two. So we're in state two, and we see A. So Again, we've got shift two. This puts our next symbol onto the stack, moving to the next look ahead, and add state two to the stack. Okay, so now we're in state two, but we have C as our next input in the input, as our next symbol in the input, so what uh, Parsing state, or what action does our table tell us to do? Shift three. So we're in state two, we see C, our action is shift three. Shift takes the next character in the input, moves the look ahead, and updates the state to be state three. Okay, so now we're in state three. We see D as the next symbol in our input. So we're in state three, we see D. Our action is shift six. So here's our next action, shift six. Shift takes the next character in the input, puts it on the stack. Moves the look ahead to the next symbol and updates the state to be the next state, six. 
Okay, so now we're in state six and we see B as the input. So we're in state six, we see B, and our action is reduce four. So this is the kind of complicated part of the parser, a more complicated part of the parsing action. So reduce means we've seen a complete production. The parser recognizes that we've seen a complete production now, um, and that production is production four. So looking at our, that production is production four, and looking at our grammar, production four is V reduces to D, D V expands to D. So our action is reduce four, which is the production V goes D. And so the reduce step works by popping off one symbol and state pair for each symbol on the right-hand side of the production. So you can imagine that this is the right-hand side of any given production at any moment. And we just replace the right-hand side with the left-hand side. So how, here's how that looks. We pop off 6 and D. And we push the left-hand side, V. And also at this point, this is where a parent node gets created in the tree. I wasn't creating the leaf nodes, but this is where a parent node gets created in the, tr in the tree. Um, we were, you know, I should have been putting these as leaf nodes. But this reduce tells us when a new parent node is, can be created in the tree. Okay, so now we've, we've seen, so you can think of this just like shift, you can think of the reduce as consuming a non-terminal symbol. So we've consumed V. So, uh, but we're back in state three. So this is effectively like being inside of production four. And then once we reach the end of it, we go back to the parent, whatever parent production we were in. So the parsing state represents some parent that we're in. Actually, it could be multiple productions that we're in. Uh, but you can think of this as kind of popping back to the parent function call. And that's why we're back in state three. So we're in a, a previous state um, that was uh, in, in, the part of the, in the parts of the grammar, in the parts of the grammar that were preceding V. So in these two spots. Those parts, those, that's the part of the grammar that state three represents. Uh, so in order to find the next state, we look at the, the now current state, the prior state that we were in, we look at the, the now current state and see which state to go to after consuming the non-terminal V. So this is also in our parse table. So in the, in the book, this is called the, uh, the go-to table. And so we just look up state three. We're in state three and we've consumed non-terminal V. So we go to state five. Questions on that? Questions on the reduce operation? Okay, so now we just continue parsing. We're in state five. We see B in the input. So if we're in state five and we see B in the input, what's our next action? We're in state five, we see B in the input. Our next action is reduce again, reduce production three. And production three is V goes to C, V. So our parsing state, we're in a state where we know we've reached the end of a production. And so we do the same thing we did for the prior reduce, except now there are two symbols on the right-hand side. So we pop off two symbols from the state. And we can keep track of that action by creating a new 
uh, tree, a new tree node in our parse tree by taking the left-hand side, making it the parent, and making the two right-hand sides the children. So pop off these two elements from the stack and push the non-terminal that we just recognized. Questions on that? Questions on that? So now we're back in state two, and we've seen a complete production V. So we're back in state two, and we've seen V. So our parse table tells us to go that we were, we're now should go to state four. All right, and then we just commence like this. So we're in state four. We see B in the input, so we reduce production two. Production two is A goes to V. You can see that there's a V on our stack that we pop off. We can pop it off by creating that new A node. And pushing A onto the stack. To find the next state, we look at our current state four and the non-terminal we just recognized and use the go to table to tell us which state to go into next. So we're in state four. And there is no state. So I messed something up. Oh, I didn't pop off. I was supposed to pop off both C and V. Whoops. Where did I go wrong here? Yeah, I didn't pop off V. Oh wait, no, no that's right. So I, I didn't actually, I forgot to actually pop off V. I didn't actually pop off V. So I pop that off the stack. That puts us back into state two. And if we go from state two to A, that tells us to go to seven. So I just forgot to actually pop the, the element off the stack. So now we're in state two, and we've seen an entire A. So that puts, that puts us, uh, we, we're in state two, we've seen A, so state two. We've seen A, that puts us into state seven. All right, question, question so far? All right, so, look, quick question. All right, so let me go through this a little more quickly. So we're in state seven, we're still on B as our input, so we look up in state seven what B, we go to state seven, and we look up what action to take on B. It's shift state eight, so we push this onto the stack, enter state eight, move our look ahead to the next symbol, and we can add that as a new leaf node. The shift is what creates the leaf nodes. So our action was shift eight. And now we're in state eight. 
and we see B as the next input, so we reduce 1. Production 1 is A goes to A, capital A, B. So we pop off how many symbols from the stack in order to match this? Three. So let's pop off one, two, three elements. And this is where we can create our parent node, A. And then push capital A onto the stack. We use the go to table to figure out where, which state to go in when we're on state two and we've seen a complete A. So we go to state seven again. So we're in state seven and we still see B in the input. We just saw this action before. So I'm guessing this must be um, reduce one again. We're in state. Oh, I forgot to put the state on top of the stack here. We're in state 7, and we see B, so that's going to be shift to state 8. So we move this onto the stack. And then the next character input is the, which I didn't write at the beginning, is the money sign, which is the end, end of the input. And that puts us into state 8. So our action was... Shift eight. That also puts a new leaf node onto the stack. Every shift puts a new leaf node. And now we're in state eight. And we see the end of input symbol. So if we're in state eight and we see really any symbol in our input, we reduce production one. So we reduce, we can construct a new parent node out of the three symbols in the input. Pop those three elements off the stack and push the new element that we've seen. Use the go-to table to tell us if we're in state zero and we see A which um, state should we go to? So it tells us to go to state one. And now if we're in state one and we see the end of input symbol, state one, end of input symbol, we accept. We're done parsing. Questions on this? So it's, you know, it's basically like a more complicated version of this finite state machine. It's effectively a finite state machine, except we have this stack that keeps track of these nested relationships between, between the grammar productions. All right, questions on that? All right. So that's parsing. Um, let's look now at what we can actually do with this parse tree. So we're ultimately, just like in the, the um, toy compiler, we're ultimately going to use this in order to translate the code into assembly. Um, but we can also do some analysis of this code. We can do uh, analysis for safety and make sure that there are certain kinds of programming bugs are avoided by the programmer and reject that program before we even go to compile and run the program. So today we're going to go over what types are, both informally and a little bit a little bit formally, why we should bother having them or whether we should have them at all, and then how we're actually going to implement them. And I'll go over the project, the next project for the compiler, and how we actually uh, build them, build a type checker for our language. So the first question is why use types? Well, okay, I guess maybe before that, what is a type? What are types? 
Anybody care to uh, venture a guess, or if they know? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to say it, classification of data. So in the, uh, in the hardware level, what, uh, what is the data type? What's the classification of data? If you're just programming an assembly, yeah. Integer, basically. I mean, they're just, it's just binary data, right? Um, it's not even an integer, because, you know, there are some binary data that are floating point. There are some, uh, but in a, in a kind of, well, it depends on what you mean by integer. If you mean the math object integer, they're not, right, because they're bounded. If you just mean, well, it's just binary numbers, yeah, they're just binary numbers. Um, the machine doesn't really uh, enforce a priori any restrictions on how you use the data, but of course, if you use it incorrectly, you may, get, you may not get the results you want, or you may get a seg fault, or a null pointer error. So types classify data. And say in C, how do you, how do you tell a compiler what class of data variables have? Yeah. Oh. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, let's get something different. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you declare variables. There's a special statement that declares variables that tells what the type is. And so why do this? So this is a pain sometimes, right? Because you run your compiler. Your program won't even compile and run sometimes if you don't get this right. You just have to kind of hack together the right types. Why bother doing this? Why bother even thinking about what the class of data is? Yeah. Okay, sure. So, so there are size differences. Like, for instance, like what, what, what have size differences? So, so sure. So, for instance, uh, if you're doing string manipulation and you're using ASCII, characters are eight, eight bits. They're one byte. Integers, depending on your machine, maybe 32 bits. And so, if you're doing some operation, some, some sort of tedious array manipulation operation, you want to make sure you're jumping the right distance to each character. You don't want to take a string and try to use integer operations on it because you may only print out one out of every four characters in your string, for instance. So even if you're not declaring your variables, if you're programming an assembly or programming a machine at all, um, you're, you need to be thinking about, what, about your, data, your data types and what structures they're in so that you can properly operate over them. Why else? Why else use types? Why, why have types in the programming language? So you can do this in assembly. You can just keep in mind or write on paper. Yeah. Also, like, like, okay, so that actually, is, that actually is a good point. So one of the benefits of using types is efficiency. So if you're compile, you're, you're comp when you're writing your compiler, you are generating assembly code that is using memory. So your compiler is going to write assembly code that will allocate memory. And if you know that you only need a byte instead of four bytes for each, say, character in an array, your compiler can optimize for you. It can lay out the space for you in a way that's more efficient than using an entire word or, or four bytes for every, every element of your array. But yeah, that, that's a really good point, efficiency, yeah. Yeah, so another benefit, just like the compiler can efficiently lay out your memory before you even run the program, uh, your compiler can also check for errors before you even run the program. So who, who's programming in Python? Okay, a lot of people. So in Python, if you make a type error, what happens? Does, uh, will the program run? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the program runs. And uh, if you're like deploying this in some critical application, and you don't know you made, some, you made some little type error, maybe you added to a string when it should have been an integer. Well, you're not gonna know about that until the program runs, and then the program's gonna halt, potentially, depending on how you did error handling. The program's gonna halt. If you have a statically checked language, that is a language where you can check the usage of types at compile time, that may be a little annoying for the developer because you can't run your program, but it means that those type errors are simply not even possible at runtime. The compiler won't even let you, won't even finish compiling the program. And so it's, so actually these two answers are great sort of duels of each other because on the one hand, it's enforcing type usage for safety 
But because the compiler knows about the types, it can optimize how space is used. And it can know ahead of time how much space you're going to need. And because the compiler restricts the usage of type, you won't even be able to compile a program. The compiler has a guarantee that those values will use that much space at runtime. All right. Cool. These are great answers. I think you guys have very good insights on this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So beyond just setting data types, like saying I want to assign a string to an integer uh, in languages other than C, C doesn't have strings, uh, you also can restrict operations on those types. And this is actually the crux of what types really are. So do I actually, uh, yeah, so I actually get to this the next time. So. You guys highlighted one of the uses here. There are lots of reasons to use types. And uh, to that, that, you know, you guys already kind of defined it. This is what a type is, at least in, there, there are lots of different definitions of types in, in this. This is kind of the most common way to think of it, is that it's a set of values or a classification of the data and operations on those values. So if you know ahead of time what all possible values of a data type are, and you know what operations can happen on those. And if you know that ahead of time, then you can just prevent all other usages of those. So if your type, so for instance, if your type is integer, then it's a set of integers, exclusive of strings, exclusive of bool even, C doesn't have bool, exclusive of all other types, exclusive of structs, and it's just the arithmetic operations. So if you try to use, say, a uh, pointer dereference or a struct field accessor on an int, your compiler can say that's not going to be valid in any execution of this program because you told me this is an integer. Integers only do arithmetic operations, so why are you trying to do a struct dereference on this? Uh, and similarly with bool, even though C actually does not have a Boolean type uh, as part of the language proper, it's part of the standard library. Um, but old bool only has two values, true and false. And the set of operations on bool are the logic operators, and or and not. Now, if you've been programming in C and you're really aware of how the machine operates, everything is just binary data. So it may seem like, well, OK, integers can be bools, and bools can be strings. But that's only true because everything is just binary data. Um, but if you know that you're going, only going to use this data in a, for a specific class of values, then you can also restrict the operations on them. And it may be less flexible in some sense, but if you're trying to, say, add a struct, that's probably not sensible in, in most cases. There are cases where, yeah, using, using point arithmetic and stuff uh, are sensible, but um, yeah. So if you can define these types of your variables a priori, then the compiler can actually check for you whether you're using them correctly and therefore eliminate at least some classes of bugs that happen at runtime. That if, say, if you were programming an assembly and you made a small mistake about which memory location you were accessing and you tried to do a floating point operation on an int, that would just go ahead and try to do floating point on some int representation. The compiler can check for you automatically and prevent these kinds of bugs. Questions so far on this? So this is the benefit of using types. Now, I base these, these definitions on a, on a paper about types that I'll, I'll show the link to it in a little bit. But there is a huge amount of variety in what people call strongly typed, weakly typed, statically typed, statically checked. Uh, I'm going to give you one definition that I think is a pretty sensible one, but they're, of course, arguable. You know, is Python typed? Is it untyped? Is it just checked and not typed? But at the end of the day, all of these languages and all this design is really just geared around safety and efficiency, trying to make sure that you can avoid bugs that come from misusing data types, from misusing the classes of data, and to make it easier for the developer so that you, you can catch these kinds of bugs early before they end up crashing a system. So 
in my definition that I'm going to use, or the definition that I use from this paper from Luca Cardelli, type languages restrict the variable's range of possible values, which is exactly what you guys defined, right? Same thing. And there are languages that, that uh, arguably do this, so Python, in some sense, does not restrict it uh, in the language, but it does have some sort of check of these types. And there are languages that do not restrict variable values, so this is supposed to be Lisp, not Lisp, Lisp, uh, Lisp and assembly. So assembly, if you program in assembly, there's no restrictions on the data types, but at runtime you may get a crash from, from the hardware. So type safe, okay, so in this framing of, of type errors, we have two kinds of errors. There are either trapped or untrapped errors. So trapped errors are errors that the runtime system, which is your processor, actually catches, like null pointer errors, divide by zero errors. Untrapped errors are arguably the more kind of pernicious errors. These are the ones where you as the programmer may have specified an int and a float, and you didn't want those to be operated on each other, you needed to do some conversion first. But the program continues running. There's, no, there's nobody checking at runtime whether you've made a mistake. And these are the kind of logic errors that are really hard to debug. And so these are things like writing past error, uh, array bounds, integer arithmetic on floating point numbers. Um, did you all learn about like floating point representation versus integer representation? Is that in computer or organization? Yeah. Okay, so I think everyone should be familiar with these. are actually different representations in the machine and the processors that have hardware support for floating point. It's a different instruction that you run. Uh, if you do integer arithmetic on a floating point number, you're not going to get the number you expect. So in this view of type safety, a safe language is a language that prevents untrapped errors for some class of untrapped errors. And there are two, pla two, two places that we can check for these misuses of uh, values. And so, just like some of you already talked about statically checked, we can check these at compile time, before the program even becomes an assembly program, but before the program is even run. Or we can check them at runtime. Uh, and so Python is a language, for instance, that does dynamic checking, at least in its current, current form. There are, there are tools for doing static checks in Python, but that kind of uh, language that's shipped standard is just doing runtime checks. C is doing static checks. So this is why when you try to compile a program that has type errors, it won't even compile. You can't run it. Python, you can. What about Java? Is Java static or dynamic? Who's programmed in Java? Oh, wow, everyone. Is this CS2? Is that why? OK. Uh, so when do uh, type checks happen in Java? Do they happen at compile time? Do they happen at runtime? Maybe both. So um, Java actually uses a little of both. So it has the kind of static compile time checking that C has. But in order to cover certain types of untrapped errors, like array, out of bounds, accesses, it leaves those to runtime. It inserts runtime checks. Uh, so checking array bounds or null pointer errors, these are sort of classically very hard things to check statically for, for kind of theoretical reasons, theory of computation reasons, decidability reasons. And so Python kind of combines the two in order to have a type safe language that checks a large class of untrapped errors. Okay, so in our type system, we define what are forbidden behaviors of the program, what are forbidden errors, and if a program has none of these, we call it good behavior. And so this allows us to define what weakly checked versus strongly checked is. So if you've ever heard of, ever heard these terms like strong checking or weak checking, in a strongly checked language like Java, for the most part, if the type checker lets a program through, then it is type safe. If, like in C, the type checker allows some programs through that are, that are not type safe, that's weakly checked. So this is the distinction between what the program actually is, whether the program actually does have untrapped errors, 
and what the checker tells you. So if the checker will not let any program through, whether runtime or, run or, or compile time, then that is a strongly checked language. That is, all the, the illegal type behaviors that the language defines, if the checker does not permit any of those, then it's a strongly typed language. A weakly checked language is a language where some of those errors might go through. So in C, for instance, is C strongly checked or weakly checked? Weakly, why? What's that? You can do a lot of bad things. Like uh, you can read, like, so for instance, like what? You can dereference null and it'll reach the hardware. You can read arrays out of bounds. And so the C type checker is like, I'm not going to check those things. You're kind of on your own. Even though in the definition of the language, those are undefined behaviors. Those are not part of the definition of C. The C specification just says, this is not part of the C language. If you write a program that reads out of bounds, you have not written a C program according to the C specification. But the responsibility of checking that is not required in the compiler. OK, so here's a little overview of typed language versus untyped language and safe versus unsafe. So this is the distinction between whether checking happens and whether the language itself defines typing rules. So Lisp and arguably Python uh, is untyped. And so here's the paper if, if you'd like to read. Uh, it's a nice, rigorous, pretty clear paper on um, defining some of these terms and also defining how you can um, model the behavior of a, of a type system. Uh, but the, the reason Lisp and arguably Python assembly are considered untyped, even though they're checked, is that they don't restrict variables to a range of values a priori. Um, so it's up to the runtime checks in order to like do that checking later. Whereas ML, Java, and C, they do restrict the values a priori. Um, and this is orthogonal to safe versus unsafe because even if you have an untyped language where you don't have to define restricted ranges of values. It's safe because there are runtime checks making sure that none of these forbidden behaviors happen. Yeah? What does the ML stand for? Oh, ML is another programming language. Um, I don't know what it originally stand for. It might have stood for modeling language or something. Uh, but this is one of the early uh, kind of functional programming languages. If you, if you take programming languages here, uh, particularly with Dr. Levins, he'll um, show Haskell which is kind of a uh, uh, descendant of ML in some sense. But it's another programming language. It's another programming language. And then, of course, C. So we have several kind of axes here. We have typed, which means the lang typed or untyped, which means the language, in the definition of the language, there are restrictions on the values that variables can take. We have when checking happens, runtime versus compile time. We have how much checking happens, that is, does the language tools actually require you to check all possible bad behaviors or not? And that's weakly checked versus unchecked. Uh, and so if a language is weakly checked, it's unsafe. If it's strongly checked, uh, then it's safe. OK, questions on this? Yeah. How can it be both safe and untyped at the same time? So yeah, so the, the, the Safe is a property of, of how much checking happens, whether the, whether the types are checked. And typed is whether variables are restricted to certain values. So the reason Lisp, and this is, this is the definition set out in this paper. Uh, it's kind of debatable about whether you, you accept this definition. But the argument in the, in the paper is that Lisp is untyped, an assembler is untyped because there's no restrictions on the, the values that variables can take. A valid program in, say, Python, you can set a variable to be any value. So Luca Cardelli's argument is that uh, the same thing as untyped is equivalent to saying uh, all variables have a single universal type that it contains all values. So this is Luca Cardelli's argument, which I, which I think is a reasonable one that if variables can take any value, the language is untyped. But that's orthogonal to whether these kinds of untrapped errors can happen in the program. So an assembler, you can, you can 
you can put both int and float in any memory location you want. And you can run integer arithmetic or floating with point arithmetic on any value you want. Uh, in Lisp, you can put integer or float any value you want in any uh, variable. But at runtime, there's a check that will prevent you from actually executing the floating point. Uh, so effectively, what happens in these languages is that a data type, if they want to do runtime checking, for instance in Python, data types are bundled with the data value instead of as part of the, the language, like the syntax of the language. And so that's why you can have an untyped language that's safe. So safety is, is orthogonal to type. Safety is this, is uh, whether these kinds of execution behaviors can happen. So can you have floating point arithmetic on integer values versus uh, are they checked or not? Or is it part of the, is it, do you have floating point and integer types in your language? Does that, does that kind of make sense? I see what you're saying. So it's, it's really about differentiating it in the language versus differentiating it at runtime. Oh, okay. I think that's, that's kind of the difference. I think that's the argument that, that Luca Cardelli is making, is that if the, the language specification says, you know, you can, you can differentiate between, like they're, they're, like in Lisp, for instance, if you, or in Python, if you, re, if you assign, say, x was int at one point and then float at another point, you can reassign uh, the same variable to any possible data. In typed languages, you can't do that. The part of the language definition itself says these variables should not, uh, should, are, are tied to a specific class. So it's like, it's almost like the distinction between compile time and runtime, because usually in languages that are untyped, usually the checking happens at runtime. But teasing this out a little more, Java, you know, Java is, has types as part of its language, but it does do some runtime checks. And you could actually implement C by compiling in such a way that runtime checks always happen instead of compile time checks. So it's kind of a, a, a fine distinction, but in practice, usually what happens is, you know, runtime checking with untyped languages, they're kind of like called dynamic, like dynamically typed languages or duck typing. In Python, they call it duck typing. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a fine, more kind of an academic distinction. But it's just really noticing the difference between whether in my language I restrict variables to have certain values versus when do I check whether bad things happen. That's really all the, all the distinction is. But yeah, good, good question. Good thing to like dig, like dig in on. Um, questions, other questions? So and it also is, is kind of, so it's related to compilers because it's like the language versus how the language is implemented. So separating the specification of the language versus how you actually implement it and recognizing that there's a lot of freedom there in actually how you do your checking. So Java, you could pass things more to the runtime checks. C, you could do more runtime checks. C, you could insert runtime checks for array out of bounds, which some systems do. Uh, but that's distinct from how the language is defined. So the language says you can't read out of bounds. Um, but if your checker does not check that, it doesn't mean the language isn't typed anymore. It means your checker is weakly typed instead of strongly typed. Does that, does that kind of make sense? It's a distinction between the specification and implementation of the language itself. That's maybe one way to, one way to say it. All right, so let's do a little demo comparing the... Uh, Comparing Python, which is arguably untyped, but, um, but strongly checked, um, uh, but st or at least safe, versus C, which is statically checked and typed, but weakly checked. Okay. All right. 
right, actually, let's start. Let's start with just a floating point number in C. Okay. All right, let's take this program here where we've assigned, we've declared x to be a floating point number. We've assigned it to some floating point value. And then we've assigned it to an integer variable. So what will be printed here? What will happen when we print, run this program? So first of all, will the program crash? Will it not crash, or will the compiler crash? Will the, will the program crash? What will happen to this program? All right, who thinks the program will compile? Oh, I just showed compile, but who thinks the program will compile? <laughs> yes, it will compile. Uh, what will be printed out when I, if I execute this program? One. So why is why is one happen? Why does one get printed out? So what what C does is C's type checker will. If it sees that there's assignments between multiple types, it will insert this cast for you. And so that's why, even though it looks like this is kind of violating type rules, what's really going on under the hood is we've got this, um, we have this uh, cast. And what does a cast do? What does a cast do at the assembly level? What happens with cast? Does cast have any computational meaning? Is it just a type system? Yeah. So, yeah, there's actually an instruction at the assembly level that says, like, convert to integer type to convert this data from floating point representation to integer representation. And that's effectively what happens. This gets converted to an assembly instruction that does that. So what if instead I try to... Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just show the. Uh... Well, okay. Let me show, let me show some cases where the C's type checker is actually uh, preventing you from from making some some errors. So let's say I've got a, uh, yeah, I've got this floating point number. What happens if I try to say, take a struct field dereference from this operation, or say an array access? So first of all, will this compile? Who says yes? Who says no? Is this, uh, is this valid C? No, because it's, this is an array index, but this thing is not declared as an array. The, other, the next question, though, is this uh, weakly checked or, or, or strongly checked? Is this part of the, or is this actually part of the checks that the compiler does, or is it not? So we have some disagreement here. Let's just see what happens. So C's type checker is not that weak, so it actually is checking whether this variable is a pointer or a vector. So this is where we can see the checking, the type checking that C does. So at, at, uh, at the assembly level, if you were to write an assembly program that did this dereference, or for instance, just this, we just do a dereference of normal cast, you could do that at the, in, in an assembly program. You could take whatever value you got from converting 1.7 to, uh, to an integer, and you could just dereference that. You could dereference address one. But C's type system, first of all, C's definition of types uh, means that C's definition does not permit this kind of operation because this dereference only applies to variables that have the type 
pointer or, or array. So this is, the, this is where we can see C's type definitions in its language, where it says, if this variable has been declared to be anything other than pointer, this operation will never work on it. Even though at the assembly level, you could dereference the number one if you wanted to. Make sense? Kind of makes sense? And so we can see the same thing with the pointer dereference. Okay, now what if I say in C, I make a pointer to an integer? Will this operation work? So I've got a PTR declared as a pointer to an integer, and then I dereference it here. Will my type checker, will C's type checker, allow this to compile? Who says yes? Who says no? It won't allow it to compile. Okay, why no? Aha, okay. So in the definition of C, this is an undefined variable. And so dereferencing it ha is not valid C. But uh, let's see what happens. Unfortunately, huh, this doesn't work. I may just have to talk loud. Okay, so this shows the distinction between the, uh, can anyone not hear me? I don't know how you'd answer that question, but. Uh, so this shows the distinction between the specification of the language where in the language, this is supposed to be undefined behavior. This is not supposed to be valid C. You shouldn't be able to even use a variable before it's defined. But because C is weakly checked, uh, its compiler will not check that. It, according to the, I think even the language uh, specification doesn't require compilers to check it. For certain undefined behavior, the language specification says a compiler is free to do whatever it wants for undefined behavior which really just means it does the convenient thing. Uh, let's see what happens when we run it. Uh, will we get, will, uh, is this, will this be a forbidden behavior? Is this going to be an untrapped error, a trapped error? So I think um, your, your fellow student pointed out that this is not good behavior, right? You're trying to dereference maybe no, maybe not no. Um, before we even do that, let's see what the uh, value of this pointer is. So this would be printing out a pointer. So now I'm, I'm using the pointer to print it out. Will this program get, is this program uh, valid C, first of all? No, because you're using an un undefined variable. Will it compile? And we've seen that, yeah, the compiler doesn't seem to mind. Uh, what will be the value? Oh, whoops. I thought X was a, uh, oh, X is printing in hex, so yeah, it's giving a warning, but it's not preventing us from, from running it. Oh, percent P for pointer? Okay, that's a good idea. Um, all right, so what would we print it out in this program? Who says no? Who says not no? Who doesn't know? Okay, so let's see. So uh, we get null, and uh, then we get a seg fault. So this gives us a null, and this gives us seg fault. So the reason it's null is because on, on my machine, or my compiler, it's either initializing it to null, or the memory location that it's pointing to happens to be null. We'll see how functions are implemented uh, in the second half of the class, uh, when you actually go to implement code generation. But these function local variables are basically just pointing somewhere in memory. And uh, if there happens to be data there already, depending on the compiler, you may just be reading that data. Uh, so anyway, so the C language, even though it says it's undefined to use a variable before it's defined, um, our compiler here is weakly checking it. 
It's not actually checking whether that's happening. And same with dereference. Uh, we now know it actually is null, but it's allowing the dereference, even though that's undefined, uh, but it's not checking it. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, it, sh it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be part of any. It isn't part of any language, right? That has types. It's not part of any language. Now, some languages like Java, the language specification says that any declarations initialize the variable to a value. So if that's, and this is all just design decisions, right? This is all design decisions. And whether or not the language implementation enforces those rules about the language. And that's, I mean, that's really the distinction between typed versus safe, which is, does the language define these rules about the usage of variables and their values? And does the implementation check those rules or not? Uh, and so we can see here in C, lots of cases of forbidden programs, even forbidden by the C specification, just won't be checked by the compiler. The compiler is not required to check those. Uh, okay, good. Questions? Questions on this? Yeah. Um, so I think it is checked. I think it is. It should be checked. No, because it kind of concatenates it. So if you print out like one, two, three as a string and then four as an integer, it'll just say one, two, three, four. So it, it's probably ca doing ca casting. If that's happening, it's probably automatically casting it to a string. So in the same way that that this uh, is, if I were to take out this cast here, like so, for instance, if I said x plus 2, it's the same question. How is it that I'm able to add a floating point number and an integer? But actually, behind the scenes, C is casting this for you. So I thought Java would give you an error. Maybe newer versions don't do that. But if it's not, what it's doing to be safe is automatically inserting a conversion for you, like saying integer.toString or something like that for the integer. Um, and yeah, and so that's why you're able to able to do that in a language that is safe, but um, allows you to, it makes it look like you can do operations on different types. But what really happens is those types are being converted for you behind the scenes. And so as part of the language, like the C specification says that that if you have an operation that's of a uh, between two types where one is less precise than the other, it'll choose the uh, It'll choose the higher precision type. It'll convert up. Uh, but then, you know, if I assign to int, then it does the, the conversion back down to, to integer. But yeah, that's a good question. And so what we'll see when we do type checking is that even though this symbol is the same symbol, the plus symbol, in languages like Java and C, the plus symbol is overloaded. It has many different meanings. It could mean string concatenation. It could mean floating point addition or integer addition. <laughs> Some languages use it to also have lists, list concatenation. And even though the symbol is the same, the actual operation is a different function. So you can imagine an explicit language having functions like int add and float add, where these are defined to t only take integers. And uh, this is only designed, only declared to take floating point numbers. And so if I try to say do int add with like this, even in C, what will happen if I try to run, try to compile this, this function? Actually, I can actually show what happens. So if I make explicit these add operations as functions, and I try to call in add on x and 2, even in C, what, what do you think will happen? Will this program compile? Who thinks it will compile? Will it not compile? So C allows it to compile because it's doing this, this type coercion. Um, but 
what it's doing is it's converting this to an integer, and it's still applying the integer arithmetic, the integer arithmetic. If I say float add, then it's going to convert this 2 into a floating point number. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So the, so the plus symbol is mapped to both of these functions in C and Java, but the compiler is inserting the correct one based on types, which is actually another reason why types are useful, because it allows the compiler to know which operation allows it to do this kind of overloading, where you, you as the programmer don't have to think about which plus operation. It can also lead to bugs, or can kind of lead to logical errors in your coding, because if you didn't mean to add an integer and a string, you didn't want a string, maybe you wanted an integer, you wanted to convert the string to an integer, then you know, it's not doing the thing you expect. But, but it is still safe, because the language is saying that we do this type coercion uh, automatically for you. Oh, is that the sort of, sort of answer? All right. Other questions on this? All right, so let's take this. Uh, let's take this pointer. Let's let's make it actually point to something. So is this program type safe? Is this program valid C? First of all, is it not valid C? Who says who says it's not valid? Who says it's valid C? So. The, the type checker should allow it to go forward. And what will get printed out here when I uh, run this program? 10, 10? The address of whatever X is. Uh, kind of hard to know what it's going to be. So, OK, so we get the address and the number 10. So what does the plus operation mean on a pointer? If I say pointer plus one. Yeah, it's adding to the address itself. Is this valid C? Who says yes is valid C? Who says no, not valid C? Is this valid like in Java, for instance? Could you do this in Java? <laughs> no. No, you can't. I mean, there's no pointer type in Java, first of all. But even the references, um, plus will be interpreted according to the class of the object. Um, OK. And so what should I uh, see as the output? So yes, it, it's valid, so it compiles. What would the output of this be? We're dereferencing some address that we don't really know about. Um, so these are all going to be different addresses at runtime because of probably address space layout randomization or something. And this whatever value is at that next address. Anyway, so that's part of the language. C def allows pointer arithmetic, even though in other, in, even though in other languages may not. Uh, this is what can allow you to do, say, a buffer overread, a buffer overflow. Uh, and I think this, is, this allowance of pointer arithmetic is what makes checking C so difficult anytime you have a pointer. Uh, if you do arithmetic on it, you're effectively pointing to any memory. So knowing what data class you have at runtime is uh, not an easy problem in C. OK, so here's, uh, here's another case. So as we talked about before, If we assign a float to an integer, C, C's type system will detect this because it knows the type of every symbol and insert the cast for you. So what if instead we try to say change the pointer type to be x? So we try to cast a 
pointer. So this might be some way we can inspect the data as a floating point number without actually inserting the cast. So what'll happen here? So if I try to print out the address of our pointer, here's the addresses of the two pointers, and then let's actually print out the uh, values of these. Is it F for floating point? Oops. All right, so uh, will this program compile? So what we're doing is we're, deref we're getting the reference of x, which is an integer, and assigning that pointer to an integer pointer and a floating point pointer. Is this valid C? I'm actually not entirely sure. <laughs> Who thinks it'll compile? Who thinks it won't compile? I'm actually not entirely sure. Okay, uh, so it gives a warning, but it compiles. So it apparently doesn't check this. And what's going to happen if I run this? So I'll get you know two addresses here. Um, yeah, what will the values be here? Is this going to be so? This one, what's the value of this if I dereference the pointer to x? That should be ten. Uh, what about this? Will this be ten floating point ten? Shouldn't be right. It should be whatever the interpretation of integer ten is as a floating point number. So let's see what actually happens. Apparently it's zero. <laughs> okay. So we can confirm that it is the same address. Um, and in our print statement, we're basically just, I mean, I think I could probably just interpret the floating point number. I mean, it gives me a warning. But it's the same thing as doing this. They're both pointing to the same address, but I'm just interpreting the data as a different type of value. Uh, and this, I mean, this kind of highlights what types are for. We shouldn't be trying to interpret integer values as floating point values because they have a different representation. And if we run into that case at runtime, we may not get the, value, the behavior that we expect. And even though C allows us to kind of subvert this type system through pointers, uh, if we don't use that part of the, the, the types, the language, or we use a language that is type safe, then these types of errors of misinterpreting the classification of data can't happen in our language. All right, questions? Questions on that? Yeah. I think so. So isn't there like, uh, well, okay, I'll just make it some large number. Let's see what happens. Hmm. Maybe it would have to be negative or something? I don't know. What's the, uh, what is it, like int max or something? There's some way to say. No, I can't remember what it, I can't remember how to get the maximum integer. Maybe it's like, is it, oh, it's standard int? Okay, thanks. It's limits. Max int. I think, that com I think that compiled, right? Uh -huh, I still can't get it to interpret. <laughs> Not a number now. Okay. Let me also try to avoid any, any type information here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to get it to... I don't know the floating point like layout enough to uh, to figure this out. Oh, okay, that kind of worked. We got we got to interpret it as a floating point number now, so you can see they actually are different. Um, but yeah, good question. I have no idea what this means. I just randomly hit numbers, but yeah, we got the two representations actually represent as like valid <laughs> integers and floating point numbers. They're obviously different because the representation is different. Um, but yeah, this kind of illustrates the value of having type system by classifying your data. Um, now, even though we subverted this for, for the non-kind of intentionally weakly checked aspects of C, 
this cast is still uh, safe. This normal cast I used. Um, well, the, the original cast I had. So if I did a normal cast of some floating point, let me add this back in. So you can see that with type checking, we can safely uh, cast this number. We, we, we don't have this unexpected representation difference, but we can subvert it with the C-type system. OK, so let's contrast this with, with Python. show the program here. So here, I have a similar problem where x is a string value, value is a floating point value, and I add the two together. So in Python, what's going to happen in this program? Will it compile, so to speak? Can I, can I start running this program? In Python, can I run the program? I should be able to run it, because these checks don't happen at, co at compile time. They don't happen before it runs. Um, but will I get an error? Will I not get an error? Is this safe? Will it check this for me, or will it just continue running? Let's see what happens. So we can tell that it actually did run because the started running print statement happens, which means it's not checking the type before you run. Like in C, you wouldn't even get the compiled output. Python is doing a form of compilation behind the scenes, it is, so it, it could do checks, but it doesn't check yet. Um, why does it do so it's just the definition of the language. So in the in the the in the uh, Python language, if you use two variables of different types, it's not going to do the type coercion for you. What's that? No, concatenation with, is with plus. So if I were to convert this to a string, oops, if I were to convert value to a string, so this is how you convert to casting in, or actually it's more than casting in Python, then um, the program runs. Because cause what Python is doing is just check it, check, checking the uh, value of the data at runtime. And it's uh, just as the definition of the language, it's not um, defined to do that like other languages. Yeah? That's probably right. It's, I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised. So it's probably picking the operation based on the first value. Oops. Uh, actually, no. It still doesn't uh, let you do it. So it's it may be picking. I mean, you can see here that it that it says can only concatenate strings. So the first value is determining which operation to do, whether it's string concatenation or floating point. And then when it gets to the second value, it's like, oh, this is not the value I expect. So that that's that's an error. Yeah. Uh, sorry, say again? Why, why? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, well, you can see here that it is attempting to do concatenation. So it is attempting to do it. So it really just depends on the language. But anyway, the main thing I want to show here is that if whatever your definition of language is, whether you have type coercion or not type coercion, um, in a dynamic language or an untyped language that's still safe, the checks happen at runtime. So this program will actually run before this check happens. Whereas in the C case, 
it'll either insert the checks for you, or in the case of trying to do a struct reference or a pointer reference, the program won't even compile. So before you even deploy this software, those checks are done for you, preventing you from even deploying the software, whereas in Python, a dynamically checked language or a runtime checked language, yeah, that won't happen. All right, anyway, okay, so it's been, been pretty long. Let's take a break now for, uh, let's come back at um, 11.10 and uh, finish up the rest, of the rest of the lecture. All right, so we went over kind of some random examples of, of C versus Python. Uh, statically checked versus runtime checks for safety. Uh, types in the language versus no types in the language, at least in this definition of untyped, meaning variables can take any values. So okay, so in this, this half I'd like to go over how we can actually write a compile time static checker for types in our language. And we're going to be writing this for our simple C language. So our simple C language has a type specification, which uh, I've given to you in the project. And um, let's go over now the kind of algorithm, one algorithm for, for doing this type checking. So the way this works is now that we have our parse tree, so our parse tree uh, makes it very easy to tell what's a declaration, what's a usage, what's a variable usage, what's a function call. So this is the benefit of having this tree, because now we know exactly where declarations are, where usages are. And so we can traverse that tree, and whenever we see a declaration, we just record what the developer told us that the type of that symbol should be. And there's a natural data structure for doing this, a, you know, a dictionary or uh, an array of pairs or a list. And we really just want a way to map symbol names to their types. That way, if we can collect that while we traverse the tree, then we can check them as they're being used. So with the declarations, if we know what the types are as we're traversing this tree, then whenever an one of these identifiers is used, say in a function call or an arithmetic operation in an assignment, then we can enforce our type safety rule. Type safety rules like only assign ints to ints, only add ints together, never assign a bool to an int, things like this. And the way we do that is when we encounter one of these identifiers, we just look it up in our symbol table. Because our symbol table, our developers told us what the type is, we just trust them. And then when we see an operation on types, we just make sure the types match. Uh, so there are some um, uh, kind of axioms in our type system, some predefined types for symbols in our language. And these are the constants. So three, for instance, is an int. It's not something the developer has to declare. That's something that's built into our language and that we, we just hard code into our compiler. 5.2 is float, for instance. True is bool. Uh, and so we have these kind of hard coded uh, types for terminals in our language. You can think of identifiers as kind of extending the language, uh, that the developer can actually extend the language with new symbols in addition to the predefined ones like constants, string literals, Boolean types. Um, and we require them to give the type for us so that we can, so we can do type checking. And I'll go over an example of actually um, running this, this type checker, what it looks like. Okay, so some terminology, scalar types, the, the value, types that just are a single value. Uh, we call them primitive types, so int, char, long, these are primitive types. Uh, so in our language, when we declare one of these primitive types, this is the syntax in our simple C language for declaring it. We give the identifier name followed by the type name. And these primitive types, at least in our language, these are also built in to the language. These are predefined which primitive types we have. Function types are built up. They're compound types. They're built up from other types. So we can take, uh, so, the, so somebody actually asked about parsing the, um, the, the function type itself. And so the way function types work is the reason they're compound is because they are built from other types. So in this case, we have a list of argument types. And here, there's two argument types here, int and int, using primitive types. And the return type 
is bool. And so this is how you can specify a function type, and this is how we can associate a symbol with a function type. So we don't really see this much when you learn about C. In functional languages, functions are also data. They're there can be assigned to symbols just like data types, like int, and can be passed around uh, just like data. C has this sort of thing, function pointers. Who's used function pointers before? Ever used them? <laughs> Who's never used function pointers? So they're, they're pretty painful in C. They don't work the way you might want, like in a functional language. But you can have functions as data in C as well, where you actually have to declare the type to be a function type and then you can pass that function around just like data. It ends up being a pointer in C. It's basically just a pointer. Okay, so we have primitive types, which are just declared to be one of the built-in types in our language, and we have function types, which are compound types, which are built up from other types. So we could even have, say, a function that takes another function. We could use an ex uh, a function type declaration here as the first argument, and say return an array type, which is another compound type. Um, but this is how you define types. You give a list of types for the arguments and then a type for its return value. So what about multiplication? Let's do an example. For multiplication, multiplica question? question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, when you're defining like a function type, how would you uh, take it like, I guess, uh, an infinite amount of like integers? Oh, an infinite amount of integers, okay. So in... Oh, 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 so this is just an example. In our, in our syntax, um, it doesn't support an infinite amount, but it does support uh, arbitrary. So I actually have this up because we got a question, a question about this. Uh, our language does support an arbitrary number of type arguments. So this syntax here, so, so it's opt because you can, also, you can have functions that take no arguments, which is just, two, which is just open and close parenthesis. And then our type list here takes is an unbounded list. So you can take an unbounded number of type parameters for your function type. So yeah, our language does support any number of, of type parameters. Does, does, that, does that answer your question? So literally taking an infinite number of types, we don't, we don't really support uh, in, in this. But I mean, C actually has a, a construct called uh, variadic arguments where you can declare a, like printf, for instance, printf can take any number of arguments at runtime. You don't have, printf is not predefined to a fixed number of arguments. We don't support that in our language, but other languages do support this. Uh, Python has a way to have arbitrary numbers of arguments at runtime. Um, but yeah, this is the grammar construct that allows us to have define um, to to uh, write the pattern for function types that allow any number of of arguments. Okay. So this is how we write function types, how we represent them. What would be the type of arithmetic multiplication? What would be the, so that, that's a function, right? It takes parameters and gives you a value. Uh, what is the data type for arithmetic multiplication of integers, let's say? What's that say? Int. So multiplication has type int. What about parameters? How do we say what parameters multiplication takes? Say again? Right, it takes two integer values. So what is the type? What does the type look like? So if this is, if this is what, uh, how we can declare a function type that takes two integers and returns a bool, how would we declare the type of a multiplication operation? Yeah. Yeah, so we can, even though this is not like, doesn't look like a function in our language, it's a symbol, some other symbol, some ASCII symbol, it also has a type. And its type is a function that takes two arguments as input, those arguments must be integer, and returns one integer as its output. And, and if you remember, I think a lot of you had to do this infix to postfix um, converter. And so you can think of this infix notation as just syntactic sugar or a, a kind of easier way to say a function call where prefix notation is what a function uses. So if I've got, say, uh, 
uh, where's my so if you recall here I declared a function that does integer arithmetic and to use that function it's basically prefix notation if I didn't have the parentheses this would be the notation for calling arithmetic integer arithmetic and so having it that not having to do the parentheses and all of this extra punctuation, there's no computational difference between expressing this function call in these two different ways. It's just one is infix because that's like what we're used to in math notation. But it's really just a function call. And there are languages where you can redefine infix operators to be functions, functions that you specify, like C++ has operator overloading. Uh, but it'll give you that syntactic sugar of, of infix notation without specifying the arguments in parentheses. Um, yeah, so there's no difference between multiplication and, and any other function. It's just a function. And we can specify the type of that function in the same way that we do for any other function. It's just because it's built into the language, you never have to express that type. But when you're writing your code, you, you know in your head that multiplication takes numbers, at least, takes integers. And if you give it an array or a struct, the type checker would fail. It should fail. And why? Because the type specification of multiplication for integers says, take two integers. So if you give a struct or a string or an array, then you would want the type checker to tell you, no, that's not, that's not valid. Questions on this? Yeah. Uh, so in our in our simple C language, we we don't actually have like floating point. We only have integers, and so I avoided having like operator overloading our language to also you know make things simple to compile. So in our language, the arithmetic operators are only going to work on integer types to make, to make things simpler. But, but um, yeah, if you wanted to uh, implement a language that is operator overloading, you could use the type system to do it for you, to help you do it. Because if you know, and we'll sh I'll show the algorithm that you use to infer types, figure out types in the language of expressions. But uh, basically, if you know the left and right operands are floating point, even though you're using the same symbol, you know in the, in the compiler that that the, the, um, the operator you want to use is the floating point division and not integer division. And so the type checker is what allows you to um, automatically figure out which operations to use that are correct for the, for the, the, type, the types that you're actually using. All right, good question. Other questions, questions on this? Okay, so we went over this a little bit, um, but just to kind of drive this home a little bit more. So the question is, if our type checker accepts a program, is it actually safe? And so it depends on the definition of safe here. Uh, so if we have a weakly checked language, then we know, even according to our swipe specification, that it's safe. But if we're not supporting all notions of safety, like for instance, does this program uh, allow you to reveal your password to users. Um, this is usually, this is something that you could actually encode as type safety rules as well, but safety depends on what our type system is. So in our simple C language, we're gonna do very simple checks just to make sure operators are being used with the same, same checks. But I already kind of covered that at the beginning of the, of the class. Um, so if you're interested in the kind of formal side of this, you can actually prove that a type system uh, uh, it ensures that every accepted program is safe. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but basically you need to define the semantics of the language and then define the type rules and then effectively you run the program uh, with those type rules and conclude that if you can, if you can prove that every program, input program uh, comes to a type, results in a type, and that type system is safe, then you can conclude that your type system prevents all errors that your type system is designed to prevent. Anyway, this goes into more formal stuff. If you're interested in the kind of formal proof side of this, I can point you to some, some research to look at that. 
Uh, but for, for our purposes, we're going to define a very simple uh, type system for our language. Where's my demo? We're going to define a very simple type system for our language, and let me show you how this type checking algorithm uh, works and what you'll be implementing. All right. So let's take this first program here where we just declare two symbols, x and y, to both be int, and then we perform an arithmetic operation on them and return that, return that value. Okay, so the first thing we need is our type checker. I mean, sorry, is our parser. And so I'm going to omit some of the names of these for simplicity. But this is roughly what your AST will look like. Uh, let's see how to design. Yeah, I think. Well, let's 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 just do it like this. Actually, so this is one kind of abstract way to to write our parse tree. Questions on this this parse tree? So this is our this is our program. This is a declaration list. These are declarations. Now, the, parse, the actual parse tree is going to like go through the type and the identifier and the semicolon. But I've simplified this a little bit to you know, omit having to write names for everything. So you know, if you were to walk over this program, you could print out the input program, in x, in y, return x plus y, by knowing the types of nodes you have. So questions on this abstract syntax tree? All right, so to type check this, as I mentioned before, we have a symbol table to record the mapping between symbols and their types. And the way this works is we just traverse the tree in a post-order fashion, collecting types and figuring out and inferring the types from expressions. So whenever we see a declaration, all we do is we record what type that symbol has in our symbol table. So we walk this tree, and when we get here, we record this type in our symbol table. Then we continue traversing the tree. We see another declaration. And we record that type in the symbol table. And now, when we see a usage of a symbol, how can we figure out what type this symbol has? Look it up. We look it up in the symbol table. And so we can annotate, can think of annotating this tree node with the type that we've discovered for that node. And so when you just have a variable use, because in our language we mandate that the developer tell us what the types are. And because we've also defined in the language that type declarations must come before type usages, this makes it very convenient for us as compiler writers because if we just traverse the tree once in post order, then we're guaranteed to have the declaration come before the usage. And this, uh, I mean, this part of the reason why in C you have to do declarations first because compiler writers don't want to have to traverse the tree a billion times, they just want to do one pass over the tree, originally. Okay, so we see a usage, and we 
can write its type on the tree and say, all right, this node, I've now concluded that is an int type. And I've done it by just looking up the type declaration that the developer gave us. All right, so if I continue this process in a post-order fashion, the next node I will hit is Y. And so how can we determine the type of Y? Just like before, we look it up in the symbol table. And so I can annotate this tree with the type. Okay, so now, if we want to figure out whether this operation is type safe, how can we figure out the type of this subtree? So this return, say this return requires an int, for instance, like if we're using in main, this, re this return requires an int. How can I conclude that this entire subtree produces an integer? Yeah? Exactly right. So if we know the type of plus, which just like multiplication, we know the type of this, the type of plus is you take two integers and return an int, then we can verify that this entire subtree is correctly typed by just matching all the parameters with all of the subtrees of this call. And if those are valid, so if the two parameter types match the subtree types, then we can conclude that the result of this operation is an int, because we know by this specification here that if we see two ints, we'll be guaranteed to get an integer, because that's the type, predefined type of plus. Questions on that? Does that kind of make sense? So because we know plus has this type, we can conclude, and so you can even think of, you could think of plus just being another symbol in the symbol table. You could think of plus as just being another symbol that we look up. So when we encounter the plus, we look up this type. And then in order to, to include what type the value at this point in the program will have, we just do the function type check rule, which is take all the parameters, these parameters here, compare them against the left and right child. And if they match, then we can conclude that the resulting type of this is an int. So what's really going on here is this is actually a logical inference. You can think of, and I think part of the reason why type theory people use this notation, is that this is really an inference rule. We are, our type checker is effectively a logical proof that the resulting return values have well-defined types. And the operations in our language, the functions and the operators, are inferences, inference rules, about what we can conclude about the resulting value of applying these operations. And these operators in the language that are built in, they have some built-in type that we predefine in our language. But functions, when we you have a function declaration, that's the user telling us, as the compiler writer, here is what you can infer about the types of function that I'm going to write. So the function writer says, I'm going to write a function that will take two integers and always return an int. And so the compiler can use that information in order to deduce the resulting types of all the values in your language. So you're really writing like an automated theorem prover. You're automated, automatically proving the type validity of your program without even running it by using these axioms that are given to you by the user and are built into the language and these inference rules that are defined by either built into the language or given to you by the user. Questions on that? Yeah. 
Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so this rule says, if I see two integers in the input, that, in, that, you can, you can, that, infer, that implies that int will be the output. This is like literally like an if statement, like a proposition. So if int and int, therefore int is the result. Yeah. So uh, in the way I implemented it, I didn't actually add it to the symbol table. I just hard coded this check in the uh, type checker for arithmetic. So I think the way the AST is set up is that there's one note for it and then the operator is stored with it. And so, I mean, you, you could actually do this as a symbol table lookup. So when we have functions, we will enter those in the symbol table. Uh, and you could do it that way. Well, the way I wrote it, I just like hard coded it in the, uh, in the checker for plus. Yeah. For say say again. Right. Yeah. There is no. Yeah. We don't have to specify a certain value. So in some sense, you can think of int as defining the whole range of values for it. And so the the beauty of this is that even if we don't know the runtime values, because we have these data classifications, because we have these bounds on what the values can be we can actually make these inferences about the safety of the program. We can infer that even if we don't know what these values are at runtime, we can infer that return will have an int because we have these inference rules to conclude for us. So yeah, one way to think of it is that these are like abstract values. These are symbols that represent all the possible values that a symbol can take. And these are rules that allow us to make conclusions about the results of those values. Questions about this example? So let's do another example, maybe a little bit more interesting example. Um, okay, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let, let me go through these examples that I have here and then, um, so let's do this one where we have int KRC and X plus C. So I'm just going to skip to the, uh, the tree here. And X, character C, and then we have a return statement here. And we have a plus again. X and C, and let's have our symbol table here. And I'll add, I'll add plus here conceptually. Okay. So just as before, we traverse our tree, post order traversal. When we see X, we can update our symbol table with the type given to us by the developer. When we see character, we can update the symbol table with that, that mapping. And now when we get to the leaf X, what type can we conclude this tree node has? Yeah. Int. Int. Because we just, when we see a variable usage, we look up in our symbol table. This is also, by the way, if you don't declare a variable and you use it, this scheme makes it very easy for you to check whether somebody's used a variable without declaring it, because if it's not in the symbol table, well, it's an undeclared variable. Okay, continuing this traversal, we, we go to C, and now what type can we conclude this node of the tree is? Care, right? We look up in our symbol table. And now when we go to type check plus, the type checking rule is that if we can conclude that the two parameters are int, then we can conclude that this whole node is an integer. But what, what do we actually have in our tree? We have int on the left side, so that matches in. But we have care on the right side. That doesn't match in. So think of this as an as a inference rule. We can't conclude 
that int is the result of this. Make sense? So now, strictly speaking, this might be an integer, this result. This might be an integer. Maybe the, the developer intended this to be a car. Maybe they didn't care. It could be an int. But our type system is not telling us all possible valid programs. Our type system is saying, if these checks pass, then our program is type safe. The converse, we're not saying anything about. It could be the case that we still get an integer and the developer can use it safely. But just like in the uh, if, the, the truth table for if, if the um, condition is false, the result could still be true. But in our inference system, we're only going to accept programs where we can match our inference rules. And it just says nothing about what all Scythe programs are. It's just saying that if we can prove the safety, then the program will be safe at runtime. But that says nothing about whether there are safe programs at runtime and our type checker will accept them. So here is where if we can't do this type checking match, then type error. And this is exactly where type errors come from when you write C. So we tried to add, say, a struct to a pointer or whatever op weird operation we did. This is exactly what the C compiler was doing. It was comparing your symbol usages, uh, looking those up in its symbol table, and then checking all the operators you're using against some type specification for that operator. So the struct operator only allows struct and a field. And if you put an int and something else, then it can't match this inference rule, and it will say, I cannot guarantee the safety of your program, and will not compile it. Questions on this? Pretty straightforward, right? I hope. Implementing is, you know, maybe a little trickier, but um, the algorithm is pretty straightforward. You just traverse the whole tree, and whenever you see a leaf, you look up its type. Whenever you see an inner node in an expression, that's some function that operates on those values. And the type rules about those functions allow you to infer what the resulting value is going to be, what its type is going to be. So these are kind of simple examples. Let's do a, a slightly, more, slightly more interesting one, where we have multiple operations in a single expression. Okay, so what does the parse tree look like for this program here? So we know we're going to have x, y, and z somewhere. Each of these are binary operators, so they're one, there's two different nodes here with two different children. Uh, what would the parse tree look like in our language for this operation? So what node is going to be higher in the tree, the plus or the multiplication? So is it going to be this, where we have plus and multiplication? Or is it going to be the plus first? And multiplication second. I guess, yeah. Do you mean this tree? The other tree. Yeah, so because our language has order of operations, then the plus will be the higher uh, the multiplication will happen first. So this operation happens first, and we get the result, and then this operation happens, and we get the result. So because we have order of operations, this is the, the shape of the tree. 
Okay, so let's run our type checker on this example. And let's put plus and multiplication in here just for completeness. That's a little space. Okay, so let's traverse our tree. We see all these declarations and we add these three symbols to the symbol table. So we get X, Y, and Z. They're all declared as ints. And so now when we reach X here, what type can we conclude that it is? An int by looking up at our symbol table. So continuing our traversal, when we see y, what type can we conclude? Int. And similarly, what type can we conclude when we see z? We just look it up in our symbol table. And now, in our post-order traversal, the next thing we'll hit is this multiplication. Multiplication has the same type as all the arithmetic operations. It takes two integers and returns an int. So what can we conclude about the type of this entire subtree, the result of the value from this entire subtree? It's an int. So we can conclude that this entire subtree is an int. And now when we go to type check the addition, and figure out what its resulting type is. How do we do the check? Well, we look at the left side for the left operator, it matches int. And we look at the right side, and what's the type of the right, right operand? Int, right? We concluded that by traversing this tree and inferring what its type's gonna be. And so when we get to the arithmetic, the plus operation, We've already figured out what the right, right operator's type is, right operand's type is, and we know the left operand's type. And so what can we conclude about the type of this entire subtree? It's int, right? Is this becoming easy, maybe? Is it becoming a little easier, I hope? And so that's how this algorithm proceeds. Each inner node is a function where you check its arguments by looking at the subtrees. And because the function definition tells you what the return type is, you can conclude what the type of the entire subtree is beneath it. And by iteratively checking the types of the subtrees, you can make a conclusion about the type of the entire statement or function or program. All right, questions on this? Questions on this. Good? All good? All right. Um, so function definitions work the same way, except when you see a function declaration, you just insert its type in the symbol table because in our language, function definitions are explicit and we have a type. So if you remember the, uh, let me get actually get an example of it. So in our simple C language, just like, oh, sorry, just like identifiers, Functions also are given an explicitly declared type, just like symbols are, just like identifiers are, or um, variables are in the language. And so this type goes into the symbol table, and when you see a function usage, it's just like any other arithmetic operator. You just look up the type in the symbol table, check the type of the arguments, which you recursively already should have discovered by doing this post order traversal, compare it against the arguments here, and then you can conclude that whenever somebody calls digit count, you can conclude that the result is an integer. And then continue popping up the tree and conclude that this assignment here is a valid assignment because I declared return value to be int, and the return value of digit count is an int, so this is a type safe program. 
Same thing for relational operators. Relational operators have the type int, int, and they return bool. Arithmetic, uh, Boolean operators have the type bool, bool, return bool. And so we can treat this like any other expression and type check this whole thing recursively and guarantee that for our definition of type safety for this language, all programs are type safe. Yeah? Uh, it could be. You mean it's not? It's never terminating. This this termination condition doesn't. Yes, because it's simply applying the same input. Input is less than zero. Call again the same input. Is what you're doing. Here. No. Uh, if x is less than zero. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Which will then go to if x is less than zero. I guess it goes. Oh, this is probably supposed to be times negative one. That's probably what's supposed to be happening here. I. Yeah, so it probably doesn't work on negative numbers. I think this is supposed to turn it into a positive number so that it'll continue. Yeah, good, good catch. Um, it's already in your tests, so. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter for type checking. So you're just checking the type. So type checking doesn't prove termination or not. It just proves type safety. And if it's type safe, then the program will be type safe. An infinitely recursive programming, may, you know, this won't hit any type errors. It just may, you know, run infinitely, but it won't hit type errors. Okay, questions, questions on this? Questions on the type checking algorithm? So conceptually, it's, it's hopefully pretty straightforward at this point. Um, but the project, just like the first project, I've given you a bunch of template code and a bunch of code to get started. And also, because we're in C, you know, we have to do a lot of uh, heavy lifting to actually manage these data structures. And so I've given you uh, and also an API for helping you to write type checking. You're of course free to, to write it however you like, but I've given you template code. And so let me walk you through uh, the project and the tools uh, that you have available um, so that you can successfully write the type checker for SimpleC. So just as before, there's gonna be a GitHub assignment. So you can, you can see all this in, um, in web courses. There's a, a, another GitHub classroom. So it's not the same repository, it's a different repository. Create that one. That'll give you the parser already pre-compiled. Clone it just like before, submit with GitHub, and remember it can be late with small penalties. In order for us to check type checking, we use the exit codes of SimpleC. So exit zero means type safe. Exit one means that there was some bug, that our data structure checks had some bug. Exit error code three means there was a type error. And I've given you a helper function that you just call whenever you encounter a type error, and it will print out a message and, and uh, also set this exit code for you. So all we're checking is the exit code. It's basically a yes, no question. Type safe, zero or three, error. Uh, but uh, yeah, so as long as you just call this type error method, the message doesn't matter. You can put whatever message you like. We're not checking that. We're just checking the exit code. I've also given the specification of the types in our language. Um, so I've written them in such a way that they ma basically match an implementation of the type checker. So they're a little, they're a little involved, but they're basically step by step the code that you write for, for, uh, for your type checker. Okay, so simple C is statically typed, which you're probably familiar with in C, that user defined symbols are only available within the syntactically defined region of the source code. Basically in curly braces. So symbols declared at the top of the program are in the global scope. They should be accessible everywhere. Uh, function definitions may only appear in the global scope. You can't have nested functions in this language. Each function's body creates its own nested scope. And compound statements also create their own nested scope. Uh, declarations bind symbol names to their type in whatever scope they appear. So if you have X in the global scope and X in the inner scope, the inner scope is the nearest scope uh, is the symbol that you use. So just like in C, and I've given you a symbol table data structure that'll make it easy to, uh, to look up, look these things up. So one kind of important wrinkle here that might be, sometimes can be confusing in implementation, is that function definitions, if they're defined in the global scope, that's the symbol table that that, that, that symbol is entered in. Uh, it's an easy mistake to make to put the function in its own 
scope because when you create a function, you create a new symbol table for that function, but make sure this, the symbol for the function itself is being added into the parent, not to the, to the function's local scope. Um, and then, you know, just like in C, you can only have one uh, declaration of that symbol per symbol name. So the type checking rules for declarations are just to add the symbol table, add the new declaration to the symbol table, and it's a type error if that symbol table already exists, or that symbol already exists in the symbol table. That's a type error. Just like in C, you know, no, no read declared types. And so here you'll just check your symbol table. If the symbol's already defined, emit a type error. Otherwise, add it to the symbol table. For function definitions, it's the, it's the same, same rule. The, uh, the function can only be declared um, once. And check that the function actually has a function type. Yeah, yeah. So you said you can't declare, declare another variable with a different type. So the In the same scope. Does so that count for the scopes within it? So could you. Uh, no, no. Right, you can do that, yeah. You can, you can, yeah. So nested scopes allow scope uh, variable um, hiding. Yeah, yeah, so only within the same level of the, of the nested scopes. So yeah, you can always, yeah, you can redeclare a variable in a new scope. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, so I've given you an API to do this. But that's exactly right. So it's, think of it as a tree of scopes or a linked list of scopes. And you don't have to manage all this because it's, it's a little bit of a pain to manage. Um, like you don't have to write the data structures if you don't want. But basically I have a variable to hold the current scope. And whenever you enter a new scope, you call create scope and update your current scope. So actually I have I've given you example code here. So I think I've given you main. So here's an example of handling scoping. So when you enter a new scope, you just call this create scope method and update the current scope. And here's how you can add symbols to the symbol table in the current scope. There's a method insert where you give it the table associated with your current scope, the name of the symbol and the type. And then here is where the traversal happens. You recursively call the checker on whatever nested constructs you need to check. So in main, the declaration list and the statement list. And they're just like with the parser, there are or the code generator, there are, there's one function for each construct type. And here's an example of checking types. So just like in our tree, when we checked the return expression, we were able to conclude what its final type was. And then in the API I've given you, I've given you code that will take one type on the tree and compare it to another type and give you true, false, you know, yes, no, if this, if these match. So just like in our example, because we did this in post order, we annotated the tree with the result of the type checking, and we can always access a subtree's type on the tree itself. So this is how we can access the type of the child and then compare it to another type. Yeah? Say again? Um, this is a se this is a, the way I've designed this. This is a whole separate phase, and so yeah, the type checker. So the, the the way this gets kicked off is you have you know you run the parser just like before, and then you call check program, passing the AST as the input. Yeah, so that that's a yeah that's a good question. So this is this is a function that takes the AST as input, and its output is the same AST with type annotations on the tree. So this is what the uh, output will look like if I've got... So if this is my program, where I declare, this is just, you know, just similar to what we did in the in class examples, 
This is what the parse tree looks like, but there are extra annotations on the expressions. So here's one of the statements in my uh, output or in my in my program, and you can see here that the in expression int expression now has a type annotation. The ident expression now has a type annotation. So any um, expressions in the language will now have a type annotation on it. And that's what gets added by this type checker. And so you'll both be adding that and also using that to perform the type checking. So when you go to check whether the assignment statement is well typed, you it's just like any other operator, you check the left and right operands and use this function that I've provided you, this compare types function to check whether two types match or whether one type is you know, of a specific type. So main I've given you already because it has some built-in types. It always returns an int and it takes no parameters. And so this is how you would compare to check if something is an int. Same thing in arithmetic. So that's how you can build, you can, you can bake in, uh, let's say, um, So for instance, in if statement, I've given you if statements already. So we don't have bool in this language, just like in C. And instead, integer uh, if statements must take an integer type. And so here, you can see the same pattern, where an if statement is a condition expression and a statement for its body. And you just recursively check the condition expression, enforce the rule that it must be an integer type, and not you know, a character or a function type. And as long as it's an integer type, move on and continue checking, and then recursively check the body of the if statement. Questions? Questions on this? So the rules are like specific to simple C. I tried to make them similar to C so that you'll kind of intuitively have a notion. But strictly speaking, a function, the definition of the language is also the definition of its, if it's a type language, has a definition of how the typing rules should be used. So I've, I've tried to give you these in a pretty explicit way that matches code, like almost line for line. Um, yeah, so, so you'll probably, have, yeah, yeah, question. So it's the same for, uh, same for the parser. So construct a program that ha is type safe and is not type safe. So, um, I've given you examples here of programs um, that are that are type safe, and uh, you can look at the rules here to find type unsafe programs. So, for instance, um, this is the rule for an address of operator. Um, it takes any type and returns a pointer to that type. So if you were to use this, say, in a place where an int is expected, like in an if statement, then that should be a type error. So you see what I'm saying? So you construct programs that, have, that are both type safe and have type errors. So for instance, logical operators take ints. If you put a pointer to a logical operator, it should be a type error. And then you can test your program to see if you have a type error. I'd encourage you to use the same strategy uh, that I gave you for the parser, where you basically pick a function to implement, ideally something near the bottom of the tree. Make sure you have a test case that reaches that, so you might need to implement part of the parent functions. And then focus on that one construct. Use the specification here, say you're doing um, ident expression, so ident expression is a simple one. Make sure you can reach the check ident expression function and then do this lookup here. Do the lookup, check the symbol table, return a type error if the symbol's not there. And so you can construct a program that uses a variable without declaring it and then check to make sure your program actually returns that error. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Other questions? Other questions on this? So you'll probably have more questions as you go along. Ask on ed discussions, ask in office hours, ask in lab. But start early, try doing some of the simple cases, and um, 
yeah. Good luck, I guess, on it. Uh, yeah. So I've given a complete example here in code of what this, what the input and output should look like, and some tips. So keep the references open. Keep the AST reference, the type rules, and the type API. And it's just a kind of a big puzzle to kind of put this all together. All right, everyone, have a good day, have a good weekend, and um, talk soon.